I am Gerardo Marquez from San Antonio, Texas. First generation immigrant. My parents are from Mexico. In 56, they immigrated to the United States so their family could have the American dream. My parents both were very staunch uh, defenders of education. Out of our five children that they had, three of us went into education, and we gave this country over 100 years of service in public education. And I'm very and a public school educator. My wife, Vianne Marquez, just retired this year after 34 years as an educator, public school. And my daughter, Kealani, is starting her third year next year as an elementary teacher. I was born in San Antonio, Texas. I've been a Texan all my life. And I know it's part of the U.S., but sometimes we don't think we're part of the U.S. We're Texas. And with that culture, we have wide open spaces. We have an affinity and a love for guns, for hunting, for fishing. I don't know if that's the last frontier, but we feel we are the last frontier. Sometimes we're compromised as Texans with the gun lobbies that are out there. But as you heard my friend Richard Small of over 40 years, him being an NRA member, him being a Republican, me being a Democrat, we agree on one thing. Our life would not change if we did not have an AR-15. We have many many conversations about politics, his side and my side, and sometimes we don't come to terms on those. We both have our own opinions about that. But we do, <coughs> we do agree that our life would not change, and both of us, owners of AR-15s, would not change if we did not have the AR-15. I know I'm speaking to people that are gonna make a difference those people that we have put in place to change laws. And here as a Texan, as a gun owner, as a supporter of the Second Amendment, I'm asking you to come up with sensible gun laws. We're off to a good start, and it's tragic that it has to come on the heels of 19 children and two teachers that sacrificed their life to continue to get this uh, movement going again. And I know 24-7 is on the right track to keep talking about this and not wait. In Texas, again, guns in the wrong hands, not too long ago, we started with a massacre in Sutherland Springs Church and shoots up the whole congregation. Santa Fe, a high school, somebody goes in there with an AR and shoots up the high school. El Paso, Texas, some crazy guy from Dallas drives all the way across the state, huge state, Texas, to get to El Paso and shoot up a Walmart. And then recently, the Uvalde tragedy. We are in a good moment right now as a country where we're talking about it, we're seeing the damage that is done. And I know there's uh, momentum right now with the right and the left talking about what to do with the senseless killing. We should not let this moment pass. I retired five years ago after 37 years in education teacher coach, the first 17, administration, the last 17. 
a principal of two high schools. I was in Ecuador with a cousin of mine just visiting a vacation, not in the U.S. at the time, when I started seeing that evening a lot of posts on Facebook, pray for Uvalde, pray for Uvalde, pray, pray for Uvalde. Well, I'm half a world away not knowing what's going on, and I'm responding to my friends, what's going on in Uvalde? I thought maybe a chemical plant had blown up, something, you know, let's pray for Uvalde, until I got the news that it was an elementary, that an active shooter had just massacred a bunch of kids there. It was a gut punch to me to be that far away and to hear that a community maybe 60 miles from San Antonio, and again, being in education and having teams, uh, athletic teams participate in all other extracurricular, that Ovalde at one time was in our district and we did compete and we do know where that community is. It really got to me, it really hurt me and once I was getting all the details and so far away, by the time I came back to the States was about a week after the incident and it was still hot in San Antonio, Texas, and then surprisingly the whole country was affected by that uh, massacre. As my friend talked about earlier that we talked about gun laws, sensible gun laws. I'm a Texan, I'm a gun owner. I don't want to give up my hunting guns, my shotguns, my handguns that I use. But again, the AR-15 is a devastating weapon as we have witnessed. I mean, just in Texas, like I mentioned, Sutherland Springs Congregation, Santa Fe High School, El Paso, Texas at a Walmart, Uvalde, and right before the Uvalde in Buffalo, they had had a massacre like 10 days before that one. It's evident, and the data shows the one common denominator is that. I am for background checks. In Texas, again, the Wawa West are still, we are civilized in Texas, I want to say that. I attend gun shows because I like to buy hunting rifles or shotguns, collect uh, those things. But I've been to gun shows with the loopholes that they have there where some of my ex-students that I know have been in gangs or still participate in gangs or run around with the wrong crowd or among the people walking around in a gun show. And again, all I know is Texas. But a gun show in Texas, if you're walking around with an AR and there's somebody that wants to buy it, they just give you the money and you give them the weapon and they walk out. There is no paperwork done to track that weapon. I don't think that's right. And again, as an educator, I don't want certain people to have weapons. There has to be a background check. Shut down those loopholes at gun shows where anybody with money can walk in and buy whatever they want. The red flag as an administrator working with counselors, daily we get a kid in crisis. We're hoping that the crisis passes. We have counselors and if not the school counselor, we get outside agencies to help us. But there's kids in distress, want to commit suicide, want to do that. And if they have access to weapons, that's not a good combination at that time when we're under crisis. So the red flag laws should be implemented. And again, that's sensible gun laws. We all have relatives. We have friends that are in that uh, disposition at one time, going through a divorce, going through this, and a weapon is probably the last thing. They're not thinking clearly at that time. I know there's some states that have a seven-day, ten-day waiting period where you buy your gun and in ten days you go get it. As a hunter, I know when I'm going to go hunting. I don't need a gun this afternoon. I should have prepared months ago because I paid to go hunting or a friend's going to take me hunting. You have enough time, seven, ten days, to wait for that gun. But again, if I'm in a state of distress and I can walk into a, a gun store and purchase a gun that day, and then it's like the tragedy in Uvalde. 
I don't think that's too much to ask for waiting. I'm speaking to the members of Congress, or I feel that you will be listening to this presentation and all the others to follow. From the state of Texas, Cornyn, I know that you're in talks right now, and serious talks, to get legislation done. Think of those four tragedies. Santa Fe, a high school. Southern Springs, a church. El Paso, Texas, innocent people at a Walmart. And Ovalde. Think of the city. And I know my senators, Ted Cruz and uh, John Cornyn, please listen to what your citizens need in the state of Texas. And I'm not advocating here. I'd be the first one to say, you're not going to take all my guns or force me. The Second Amendment protects us from that. But there should be some limit on what you can use. My friend Richard Small a Vietnam veteran trained has proven that you don't need the AR-15. And surely not in 18-year-olds. I would propose 25 years old by the time young people's brain uh, develops enough to have sense on what to do. But surely 18 to move it up to 21 is not much to ask. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to 24-7 for inviting me to speak. That if we don't convince our lawmakers to move quickly, that the citizens of the United States say enough is enough. Let's not waste these 19 children that just happened and the two teachers. We owe it to them. Thank you very much.